Seven hours later, seven grueling hours of move your leg this way, flick your ear this hard, run on this treadmill, do push-ups, punch this dummy later, mixed in with Stormy trying to teach me spells, I was finally able to slowly trot out of the physical therapy, slash magical training, slash torture chamber, and head back to the room we all shared. All I wanted to do was take a shower, then lie down on my bed and pass out for a week. Storm was right about the Cloud Walker spell. It only took me 10 minutes to learn it and 15 to do it perfectly. She had a Pegasus who grew up in the Ministry, fly up to the Cloud Lair and get some clouds for me to test it on. I could still hear Stormy's laugh as I fell through it, not once, not twice, but 18 times. You'd think she'd cared more about a mare who had just woken up from having her new limb, ear, lungs, and heart replaced in a technically experimental surgery? Nope. She cared more about how my body was doing with the new stuff attached and how well I could do magic. After she taught me the Cloudwalker spell, she moved on to teaching me stronger telekinesis. Then, from there, she taught me a new spell called Night Eye, making it so I could see in low light, even pushback areas. I kind of liked that one, though I failed about the same amount of times as I succeeded, if not more. After everything else was done, however, she showed me a spell that I found extremely useful, one that she was surprised I picked up on very well on the first try, the locator spell. When I casted anything of value, say caps, bits, ammo, food, and so on, shows up green in my vision. But that wasn't the best part. It also gave off a faint glow of red when I was close to traps. She said she it didn't always work for traps, but it would make grating around places a lot easier than if it would be without the spell. I slowly walked into the room as the door hissed open, finding only Solstice in the main chamber, finishing up a book. As I walked closer and she looked up, I saw it was one of Windthrasher's romance novels. I rolled my eyes, saying, Don't tell me you like those trashy books, too. I can't say that I like them per se, but I can't seem to put it down. The story itself seems predictable, and then you get deeper into the story and you find out that it's not, she said as she folded a corner of the page down to mark a place. Is there sex in it? I asked. Well, yeah. Quite a bit at first, but the story's good too, she said. Then it's a trash book, I said, walking past her towards one of the bedrooms, looking forward to a shower. It's not trash, I heard Wind Thrasher say. I almost jumped, then looked up towards the ceiling. I saw she was laying on a beam reading her own book. She glared down at me, saying, Knight Everhoof is a noble stallion who can't decide between the princess he wants to marry or the beautiful thief he meets in the first book. At first, he hates the mare, seeing her only as a common thief who needs to be put into prison, but then they're forced to go on an adventure together, and he starts to find out that she's more of an amazing and powerful mare who has a side that most ponies don't even know about. In book three, she finally tells him how she feels. Solstice covered her ears, yelling, Don't tell me! I still want to see if Lightstep is going to betray Knight Everhoof in book two. Stop spoiling, damn it! I hate you too, I said, walking past them with a sigh of irritation. Give me a book about adventure and magic any day. Leave out the sex in every chapter or the way too long makeout scenes. I mean, who needs to explain kissing for like four pages? For fuck's sake, it's a kiss, not a damned explanation of the universe. Hell, yeah, I kiss Aura whenever I can. I like it. I love it. But I don't need to go into full detail about how long it went on, the amount of passion I felt as our tongues met, or the noises we... Fuck it. No, I'm not doing this. I'm taking a fucking shower. They both laughed as we... as I left Windthrasher yelling after me. You do make a really interesting queak sound when Aura kisses you. Bite my soon-to-be plastic ass. I yelled and slammed the door. Their laughter at my expense went on for some time as I was cleaning myself off. 
When I was done, and my mane was mostly dry, I went back into the living room to find Aura and Vervain waiting for me with Wind Thrasher and Solstice. Bite and Wingnut were also there, looking as if they'd just walked in a moment before, dragging a broken robot behind them. I wasn't even going to ask. Instead, I ran over Vervain and hugged her as tight as I could. She hugged me back, and I felt tears falling into my mane as she broke down. I'm guessing Aura filled her in on what happened with Mom and I, because a moment later she said, I'm so happy you're okay, and if I didn't see it, I wouldn't believe you were whole after what I was told. When I meet this director, I'm going to thank her till I'm an old mare. You heard about Mom, I'm guessing? I asked. She pulled away, nodding. The synth told me something happened to her, and Aura just finished filling me in on a little bit ago while she was showing me around the ministry. I can't believe this place has been here for so long. The Steel Rangers never found it. From what I've gathered about this place, it's deep underground, I said as I dried my eyes. But I need to tell you something about the director. Vervain lifted an eyebrow. What about her? She's... I started to say, but right then, the door to the room opened and White Oak herself walked into the room. She took one look at Vervain, pain written on her face as she completed what I was going to say. Your mother. Vervain's eyes were as big as saucers as she looked at the mother she thought she'd lost twenty years ago. Her hooves wobbled a little as she said, How can this be? My mom's been dead for a long time, and... You look the same age she did when she died. I should have died, yes. But thanks to the Ministry, I was saved, and their technology has slowed my aging down quite a bit. Vervain, my sweet filly. I've missed you so much. White Oak said slowly as she took a few steps forward. Vervain looked at me, then back at her mom, saying, This can't be true. She's a synth, isn't she? If my mom was alive, she would have found a way to tell me. I tried. But back when I was first brought into the ministry, I wasn't allowed to send messages to you. Between the months I took from them to fix me from the attack and the time it took for them to trust me, it was too late. When I was finally able to get a message to you, I saw that you and your father had both moved on. Later, I tried to get a hold of your brother, but... By then, he was already too far gone to make contact, she said, looking nervous. Vervain's face went from confusion to utter anger. Her limbs stopped shaking, and rage filled her voice as she said, Do you have any idea what it was like for the rest of us when you died? Dad went into a deep depression. He was barely able to run his shop. He left the Steel Rangers, ignored me, grew even more distant with Wolfsbane, got addicted to rage and dash again like when we were foals. It took him two years to get back to his old self, and by then Wolfsbane wanted him dead. I became a knight and stopped speaking with him by then. Our family fell apart because of your so-called death, mother. It got so bad that my own depression caused me to leave the only buck I'd ever cared about. And this whole time, while all of this was going on, you were here... Working with one of the biggest enemies of the Steel Rangers? I had no choice in the matter, Vervain, White Oak yelled. But I did everything I could to help whenever I could once I became the director here. I stopped a lot of what the Ministry was doing. I started looking for ways to help the Wasteland. Hell, why do you think Grimm ever met you? It's because I made sure she worked with the right stallion at the right time to make sure she met you because I knew you were the one mayor on Equus that Grimm could trust with our mission. I hated every day I had to watch you and your brother and your father go through your life missing me. But I couldn't do anything about it, and when I could, it was too late. Ask yourself this. If you'd gotten a random message from the Ministry, or just some mayor saying she was me before you saw me, would you have believed it? Ravane's face fell a little, but the anger never left her eyes. Probably not, but even if you couldn't let me know in the normal ways, I know you well enough to know you could have found another way. White Oak sighed, and then said, I did find another way. You were the one who didn't want to listen. What do you mean? 
Ravain asked. Fourteen years ago. Do you remember when your patrol was attacked by raiders? One of them was a former Steel Ranger who joined up with them? He attacked you but never tried to kill you? White Oak said. Yes. He kept yelling things about he has something to show me. I killed the asshole, Ravain said. He wasn't a real pony. He was one of our first generation three synths. I replaced him a few days before that attack. His Sith chimp went bad, or he would have been able to tell you that he had a message in his pocket from White Oak. I saw that fight from another synth we had watching. You killed all the raiders, took the small amount of tech you could, and find and left without looking for anything else on them, White Oak said. Just like most steel rangers, you only cared about the tech and not what else their body could have on it. So I tried again, two years later, by sending a real pony who was working with us to try and join the steel rangers. She was let in and was given a chance to join. She tried to befriend you. Her name was Chipper? Vervain looked a little less angry now. I remember her. She was annoying and always asking me about tech and asking me about my mom. I got so annoyed with her that I told her I didn't want her following me around or talking to me anymore. She wouldn't stop, so... She stopped talking, looking ashamed of herself. Yes, you had her sent to Halo 1 to work with the other scribes where she was killed by another Steel Ranger who thought she was a spy for the Enclave. White Oak said. Do you even know why she was suspected of that? Sandstorm said she was sending messages to a mare from the Enclave, Ravain said. Yes, a known Enclave unicorn who was really working with us. That was Grimm, when she had just left the Crystal Empire. After that, I knew I'd have to send Grimm herself to you. But after a while, I knew I couldn't have her telling you who I was anymore, because you wouldn't have believed her. So once Grimm got a few things I needed her to, I made sure she worked with your brother to get into the Steel Rangers, New Pegasus, and befriend you, White Oak said. So, you can hate me for not being around, but don't blame me for not trying. So, Grimm was only my friend to help you? Vervain asked. I cut in, saying, No, she did care about you, Auntie Vervain. She lied, yeah, but she did count you as her friend. More tears were in her eyes as she said, How can I know that's true? because she wouldn't have left me in Stable 28 unless she trusted the pony she was leaving me with. She trusted you more than ever, her best friend Stormy, to watch over me and raise me. No matter what her mission with the Ministry was, her friendship with you was real. And I said with a small smile. Rain sniffed, then took a moment to compose herself. Finally, she looked at me with a smile. You're right. Grim had her demons, but she loved you more than her own life. Something she proved when she gave it up to keep you alive. I just wish she could have trusted me a little more than she did. She looked over at White Oak. One day I want the full story about what happened to Mom. But, for right now, I don't want to talk about the past. Trust me, deep down I'm happy that you're still alive. But I can't push past the anger I feel towards the Ministry for taking you away, or you not finding a better way to get back to me. I'm here for Shadow. I could see sadness in White Oak's face as she replied, And that's perfectly fine and understandable, Vervain. I do need to know something. Does Wolfsbane know you're alive? Vervain asked. White Oak slowly shook her head. No. I did try to get in touch with him more than once, like I said before, but he killed my messenger for even daring to suggest I was still alive. Even if I tried sending a synth that looked like me to see how he'd react, I knew he would have just destroyed it. He's always been a hot-headed stallion. He's also more stubborn than your father ever was. Now that I think about it, he'll probably kill me after suspecting that I was a synth. You've already suspected as much because of my appearance? He's lost to us, Ravain said. Wolfsbane was lost to us ever since you vanished. His one reason I left Wanos Los Alicorn. He did everything he could to make my life hell before he was elder. 
So a few months after I thought you died, I went back to New Pegasus to be around Dad. Aura spoke up, asking, You know he has to die, right? Aura, I said. Not now. Vervain shook her head. No, she's right. My brother is evil. His wife is just as bad. He needs to die, and I think we should try to take care of him as soon as we can. <clears throat> Are you sure? I asked. I know he killed Box Tape, but he's still your family. He is my family. But that doesn't mean I can't kill him. <clears throat> White Oak sniffed and turned around. I understand what has to be done, but I won't help you with this. He may be a lost cause, but he's still my son. If he must die, I don't want it to be by my hooves or plans. If you're going to go after him while you're sneaking around the Steel Ranger compound, then I won't help you. Mom, he's not worth saving, Vervain said. <clears throat> I understand, Vervain, but no matter what, no mother should ever harm her child, even if they're as bad as Wolfsbane has become. So, if you want my help getting into Stratus, then you have to promise me that you won't go after him. If something happens while you're in the ship, and I can't do anything about it, that, but I won't help you actively kill him. White Oak said. Ravain looked like she was getting ready to argue, but then I cut in. I make no promises that I won't try to take his life if I can. If it helps, I won't go looking for him either. Is that good enough for you, Director? I can see the pain in her face still as she nodded slowly. That's all I can hope for. Good, I said, then looked back to Vervain. Did Aura tell you why we had you come here? And she said something about sneaking into the Steel Ranger compound under the Applewood sign. Not much else. Why? Vervain asked. I grinned. I'll tell you all about our plan and what we're doing next. With that, White Oak, Vervain, Aura, Windthresher, and I all sat down and started going over our plan to sneak into the Steel Ranger compound and steal ourselves one of the Enclave's airships that the Steel Rangers took. Stormy joined us uh, an hour into our planning, then later Stardust and the rest of my friends did as well. A few hours after that, not only had we planned our mission to getting into the Palisade, but added more to Stardust's plans too. <clears throat> a little while later, just before I was planning on getting ready to set out for a place called Miss Maple Tree's Cafe on the other side of what was called Dragon Bridge, I found myself in Oricalus's room. I was finally told that I could see him, and not a moment too soon. Rain was with me, and I was happy for her support. From what the doctors told me, he was extremely lucky to be alive at all. Like me, he had parts of his body replaced with synthetics. However, unlike me... All of his were inside of his body. Most of his internal organs had been replaced. Same for a few of his bones. When I first walked in, I expected to see a skeletal corpse-looking body I'd seen when he first got his body back. But I was surprised to see a mostly whole-looking Oricalus. He was looking over at me with a small smile on his face when I walked in. He was still very skinny, but he had uh, to have put on a few pounds since I last saw him and his face didn't look like a skull with flesh over it anymore. His purple eyes were more vibrant than before, and he looked healthy for the most part. As soon as I drew in close, he lifted his forelegs to me, saying, It's good to see you again, Star. With more tears falling down my face, I ran over to him and hugged him tight. He winced, but let me hug him. As I did, I said into his neck, I've never been able to hug the real you. He laughed a little. I used to hug you all the time before your accident. Now, can you let me go? I'm doing a lot better, but I'm still very weak, and apparently you're very strong because this hurts a bit. I backed up, drying my eyes. When I heard you were awake, I had to come see you before I headed out. He frowned. Where are you going? You know, doing what I do best, saving ponies and causing trouble. The normal stuff, I said with a laugh. He didn't return that laugh. 
He looked over at Vervain, saying, What is she planning to do, Vervain? And why are you here? I thought we left you a new Pegasus. It's a long story, Oricalus, but we're heading to Dragonbridge to meet a contact that can help us get into the Palisade. Vervain replied. His eyes went big. You can't. If Wolfbane finds you, he'll kill you on sight. I know, but we have to go. I'm not going to there to fight him or anything like that, even though I'd like nothing more than to watch him take his last breath as I squeeze it from him. We need to get her hooves in one of the Enclave airships that they've taken over the years, I said. And what in the goddess's name do you need an Enclave airship for? I know your sky carriage was destroyed, but we can find another way to get home, he said, looking worried. I'm not going back to New Pegasus yet, Uncle Ori. I'm going to Stratus. My dad's going to be executed in a few days. I need to save him and Thundercracker. He's been caught and will be killed along with Dad. So you're going to risk the life your mother gave you uh, to save, just to get two stallions out of prison. Are you crazy? I know you love your father, and greed has been a lot of help to you, but you can't risk it. Stratus is a big cloud city, and you're the most infamous unicorn there. You'll never even make it past the docks, he said. We have a plan, Uncle Ori. I'll have Stardust and Solstice with me, and Stormy has a way to help us disguise ourselves, I said. He took a moment to calm down, then finally laid back onto his pillows. I don't like this. Even with all the planning on Equus, there's still a lot of risk. I guess you're a lot like your father in some ways. You'll risk everything to save some pony you care about. Mom would have too, I said. She did. That's why if I can't stop you, then I'm going too, he said, trying and failing to get up. Before I could say anything, Vervain walked over to him, pushed him back down onto the bed. You'll do no such thing, Oricalus. Shadow told me what happened to you, and it's a miracle you're even alive. You're too weak to do much more than sit up right now. She'll be fine. Have faith in your niece. She's proven herself time and time again. He was breathing heavily from just trying to get up. Finally, he gave in and sank back down. Are you at least going with her, Vervain? She shook her head. I'm helping with the Steel Rangers, then coming back here. I'm an Earth Pony. There's no way I could pass for a citizen of the Enclave. Stardust and Solstice will be there for her. Also Solstice's mother, Fairy Glitter. From what I've learned about her, she's a good pony to have on our side. And she's helping. True. Fairy Glitter comes from a long line of strong and smart ponies. When I was still pride, we used to try and keep an eye on her. But she's never known or shown outward signs of betrayal. If Pony Pony can get you in, it's her, he finally said. I was wondering about that. Why would a pony as well off as her betray her own kind? I asked. Is it just because of Solstice made being made a Dashite? He chuckled. First of all, Solstice is not a Dashite. Not without the mark on her flanks. She's a runaway until she's branded. As for Fairy Glitter, well, the Enclave higher-up started getting suspicious about her about 18 to 20 years ago, before I was pride. She lost a fold of sickness that hit a few families back then. As you know, this sickness wasn't real. It was how they got the folds for the Devil's Children program. A couple of years after her foal died, or so she thought, she started showing signs of treason. At first, she was quite open about it. But after she was almost brought in on charges, all of her activity seemed to stop, and she went back to being a loyal servant of the Enclave. Over the years, information and secret plans started getting stolen from the Enclave databases. All looked into the same thing. The Devil's Children program. So she wants to find her lost filial cult? And that's why she's against the Enclave? I asked. I believe so. Though the odds of her ever finding him, or her, are slim to none. Most of the ponies from that first class didn't make it. They had their memories wiped and new lives implanted into them. No records of them exist to follow, so she'd have a hard time following anything. But still, 
She's always been on the High Council's radar. Mine too, she said. Why would she help me find my dad, then? I asked. He laughed again. Because Fairy Glitter and your father go back many years. They've been friends since they were foals themselves. They were one of the only families left from the Children of the Night who still kept in contact with Night Stalker's descendants. If Nightshade died, it would be like her losing her own brother. She thinks of him like family, and the ties between those two families are deep. I'm not surprised she's helping you or him at all. I didn't know that the families of the children still kept in contact all these years later, I said. Mostly just those two. Thunderlane's descendants haven't gotten along with any of us in years. My own family fell from grace when my mother was young. No pony knows what happened to Bab's kid. Greta's become the Red Talons, that's about it. The only other member of the children who I know are around is this nutcase. I said. Wait, who's this? Is there another descendant I haven't met yet? I asked. Oh, you met him all right. At least from what I remember when I was still hiding in your shadow. He said. The Caesar of the Romans is the only living descendant of the zebra who helped Night Stalker during the war. Wait, so you mean that V. Caesar is related to the old one? from before the war, so he's not just full of bullshit? I asked. Nope, he's the real deal. From what I've learned of the buck, he's nothing like his distant grandfather. He has unrealistic and overly radical goals that defy the original beliefs, Orikala said. I had no idea. Damn, that means I have to go talk to him again, I said. Why would you do that? He asked. I have to agree. Talking to any of the Romans is a bad idea, Shadow, Ravain said. He's one of the descendants of the Children of the Night. Our families go back for two centuries. It's possible he could be part of this curse bullshit. He might even know more about the past with our families and whatever happened with Noir. Also, at the very least, I may be able to work something out with them since Mom died. The Caesar asked me to kill her if I ever found her to pay her back for betraying him a few years back. I could use this to my own advantage, I said, starting to pace back and forth. I don't know. I don't like the idea of you going to the Romans. They're dangerous. Even more so than the Steel Rangers are, I think, Orichala said. So is everything else I do. If I don't take the risks, then I'll never get anything done. Also, I have a strange feeling that Aquila will try and work something out with them, I've gotten most of the memories back from when she was using my body, but some of it's still fuzzy. If I can turn them against her before she has the chance to get them on her side, then that could help us out a great deal, I said, looking at Vervain and Orichalis. I don't see why the Romans would work with her. She's of the stars, and they have some sort of religious thing with the stars that would cause them not to trust her, Vervain said. Orichalis on the other hoof looked like he was thinking about the idea. Vervain, she might be onto something with this. Vervain looked over at him like he was nuts. Why in the goddess's name would you think the zebras would work with a monster like Aquila? Because one fact about their race is they are both revere and fear the stars. Aquila is a true child of the stars, and if she's right, she's from one of the oldest known constellations. If she can prove that to Rotan... Then, she could get them to follow her almost like a goddess. If that happened, she would have a powerful army at her back, he said, sitting up a little. And you could also be crazy, Orichalis. The Romans are zebras who follow the old ways, at least according to what I've been told. They wouldn't follow any pony who claimed to be a child of the stars. If I remember right, there was an old prophecy about this very thing being the Caesar's downfall, Ravane said. I don't care, Ravane. I'm not going to risk it either way. At least, if I'm wrong, then nothing bad will happen because of it. However, if I'm right, I'd rather get ahead of it now rather than deal with the consequences of it later. 
Ness said. I keep forgetting that you're not a fool anymore, Bervain said, sighing deeply before continuing. I can't stop you, but at the very least, have a plan before you go walking into a Roman camp, okay? Auntie Bervain, please. I'm not focusing on that right now. I have to worry about how I'm going to get into the palisade, I said, slowly getting back to my hooves, still amazed at how real my new limb felt, yet foreign at the same time. I still don't like this, but I guess I can't stop you either. So at least do your best to get in and out. Don't go hunt down Wolf's Bane. He'll be in his domain, and that's not the right place to take him on. Nori Callus said. I know, and I don't plan to. Unless I get extremely lucky. You know, like slicing his throat in his sleep, or uh, trapping his toilet with a high-voltage cable somehow? I said. Which means you'll go looking for every opportunity to kill the prick. Boricala said with a sigh. I couldn't hold back a smile. Ah, you know me so well, Uncle Ori. Anyway, get better soon, okay? I want to get you back home as soon as I can. Star, I mean it. Be careful, he said as I hugged him again. She will be. She'll have me with her, Vervain said with a smile. And when I get back from helping her... I'll be heading back here to see what I can do to help you get back on your hooves. I saw a strange smile pass between the two of them, one that made me turn away and just shut my brain down. Yep, I don't have time to deal with this mess. So I headed out of my uncle's room, Vervain not far behind, as we uh, walked back towards where I was going to be meeting up with one of the synths who would take us to where Dragon Bridge was. I looked to Vervain and asked, do you think we can really make this work? I think that nobody can tell you what you can and can't do. You've beaten every odd thrown at you and survived. You just have faith that the goddesses are watching out for you and you'll be fine. Mervain said, turning her head towards a large area where most of the ministry ate. One last thing before we head out, Shadow. I watched as she turned towards the eating hall. My ears drooping a little. I'm not going. I have too much to finish up before we head out in a couple hours. I'll just wait for you by the teleporter thingy. She reached out a hoof towards me. Shadow, this is the last chance you'll have to say goodbye. I slapped her hoof away, visions flowing through my mind as she spoke. Again, the nightmares were back. Watching her vein die by my hoof, mom's head falling from her body as misery sliced through her neck. Mom saying her last goodbye to me as her body turned to dust. I was shaking as I took a step back. I'm not going. I I can't go. Her body isn't even in that room. She's gone. What good is it for me to go and say goodbye to the empty air? Shadow, yes, she's gone. But this is a way to show her soul that you cared. That you miss her. If you don't go this, you'll regret it one day. Trust me on that. I backed away again. Still trying to use get the images from what I saw in the caged world out of my head. I said, I'm not going. A sad look came over her face as she looked down at her hooves. Okay, sweetie. Just think about it. I do hope you change your mind. She continued on, leaving me alone with my thoughts. I took a seat on a bench next to the fountain in the middle of the main chamber, watching as the ponies and synths passed me by. All of them going on about their business. Not a care in Equus about what was going on in the world above. I'm not sure how long I sat there doing everything but thinking about Mom's death. Something I'd been trying to forget since it happened. But sometime later, some pony came and sat next to me. I just ignored them, looking down on my hooves as they spoke. I remember the first time I came here. I heard the voice of my mother say. My head snapped up, and there she was. Only, she looked more ghostly than real. I noticed another thing, too. No other pony was around. For the first time since I'd come here, no pony was in the main chamber, and it was dark. I could barely make out the other side of the room. I looked back at her, asking, Is this real? She looked around, then shrugged. She looked like she had when I was still a filly. Her face young, her mane silver, 
her eyes bright and shiny gray. She smiled at me. I'm not sure, honestly. You could be dreaming. Either that, or I really am crazy, I said. That's possible, too. We do have a bit of a mental breakdown problem in our family. Let's just say this is a dream. You should know that dreams carry more in them than most ponies do. I did a whole study on it when I was in school. Fascinating stuff, she said, leaning back on the bench. I could feel tears falling as I said, Real or not, it's good to see you again. Even if you never will remember who I am. Not fully, at least. Shadow, what happened in my life is no longer a concern. Memories are more than just connection to one's brains. Memories are carried through our very souls. In life, I may have forgotten much about, but in the life after, I could never forget you, my little star. She said, putting a shadowy hoof on my shoulder. So, are you a ghost? Or something like that? Phantom? No, that's the same thing, I asked, noticing that I couldn't feel her touch. Something like that, she said with a chuckle. Enough about me. What's wrong, sweetheart? Everything. I still can't get what happened to me in the cage out of my head. I thought I did for a while, but now it just keeps coming back to me, and you're... You're gone. I was looking for you for so long. Went through so much just to find you, then to save you from yourself. Then you just died to save me. I'm so angry and thankful at the time that you did for me. I, I can't get my head straight, I said. Shadow, I knew everything you did to find me and save me. And I'm sorry that I couldn't be around for you more than your life. The truth is, I never wanted to die. But I wouldn't have ever let you die so I could live. No parent would ever do that. No matter how messed up I was, you need to stop dwelling on the past and start thinking about the future. She said. But how? I asked with a sob. By taking each step at a time. Things won't get better overnight. But sooner or later, you'll start feeling a bit better. And then, you'll be back to your old self. You'll start looking back at the time we had, no matter how short it was, and you'll cherish that time, she said. I... I don't know if I can. I know I have to work through it. I know I have to be there to help the other ponies in the wasteland, but... It's just... It's all so hard. I'm just a filly, I said. She shook her head. You stopped being a filly the day you stepped out into the wasteland. You can't change that, not anymore. You had your chance to step away from all of this and go to Manhattan. You could have even had opportunities to turn away. But that's not the mare you are. I just wish I could be some pony else, I said. She smiled. I'm sure that's what that mare friend of glory thinks, too. Same for that stable dweller I've heard about, and for every important pony in history. Your distant grandfather, Nightshade, hated his role in history. He wanted nothing more than to disappear and let every pony else deal with the war. I'm sure some of his team or the princesses did, too. Some of the children did, as a matter of fact. Minette and Amethyst Star both did what they could to get out of the war. Same for Babs, but ponies like you, like Blackjack and the Stable Dweller or Night Stalker, they can't do that. All of you have one thing in common. None of you will ever let any pony else fight your battles for you. Also, neither them nor you would ever have put ponies you love in danger to keep yourself safe. Just like me. Now I want you to get up, and I want you to do two things. First... Talk to Stormy about your bad dreams. She can help. And talk to your friends. You'll need them in the coming days, and it's about time you stop ignoring them to wallow in your own pity. I couldn't help a small chuckle, followed by another sob. I'm... going to really miss you, Mom. I've always missed you, but now it's... it's final. I know you're not coming back. 
She smiled again. Just know that I'm always watching you. I may be gone from this world, but that doesn't mean I'm not still with you, she said, then poked my chest, right over my heart. I'll be right here. Also remember that you still have your father, so go find him, save him, and remember, always shine brighter than any pony else has before. You always say that. What does it mean? I asked. If you want to find out, then you'll have to go figure it out on your own, she said, her form starting to shade, fade. Mom, you never answered me. Is this a dream or real? I asked. She laughed, a pure sound that I haven't heard ever from her. I do believe this is a dream, my little star. But who says that dreams can't also be real? I jerked awake before my head fell back onto the bench. I looked around in a panic, almost knocking over a mare who was walking by me with mounds of paper in her magic. The main chamber was full of ponies again, so I had been asleep. I shook my head, getting back to my hooves, but as soon as I did, I felt a tingle of warmth in my chest. With a smile, I touched the spot where Mom poked me, right over my new heart. I looked up in the darkness, hiding in the ceiling above, saying quietly, Real or not, thank you, Mom. I took a deep breath and headed towards where my friends and family were, all saying goodbye to my mom. I knew it was going to be hard. I was probably going to cry again and miss her all over again. But I knew that deep down I needed this. It was the only way I was going to be able to move on. To get past the shit I've been dealing with. So I went to mom's funeral. I sat with Aura and my friends and listened to the ponies who knew her tell stories about Grimm's life. When it was all done, oddly I felt a little better knowing that I had this small piece of her to take with me. No matter how long I lived, I'm still not sure if my dream was just that. A dream or mom speaking to me when I needed her most. But either way, I took her advice. I went to find Stormy, bringing my friends with me. It was time to explain everything. Are you ready for the shadow? Vervain asked as we headed up to meet with a synth who'd be helping us. I'm not sure about anything anymore, Auntie, but I don't have the luxury to wait, I said as I looked at myself in the reflective windows we passed by. I was still finding it strange to see myself looking so oddly. After I spoke to Stormy about my problem, she told me I had something called post-traumatic stress disorder from the experience I had in the cage. There wasn't a lot she could do medically at the moment for me. It took time and a few other things to help with the symptoms. She told me a few things I could do that would help until I could come back, and she could treat me. After that, she took Vervain and me and used some machine of hers to change what we looked like. I don't understand a single thing about what it did, but now my coat was light blue, my eyes were an uninteresting brown, and my mane was a honey gold. Vervain looked a different too, with a brown coat, a green mane, and matching eyes. She was also covered our cutie marks. Mine was a simple book. I don't know why. And her veins was a stream of code. Why did she get to have a cool one? My friends listened to my story as Stormy worked on me, and all understood what was going on with me now. The one thing I love about them is that they didn't question me about my ability to do the mission. They all knew me well enough to understand that I could handle myself. So now Vervain and I were about to go back into Los Alicorn. Well, east of it, and meet with this contact to start the new leg of my quest. I just hope you're right about all of this, she said. Well, I'm sure I'm right about anything anymore, but it's too late to turn back now, I said. True. So, how are you doing with your spell work? She asked. It's getting better, I said as we finally reached one of the transporter rooms. The question is, are you ready? She sighed as a synth, wait, a courser, that's what White Oak called them, came up to us. As ready as I'll ever be. 
The courser looked over at us, with his eyes covered by sunglasses. Hello, I am X-532. Are the two of you ready to be transported to Sector 13? Yeah, let's get this over with, I said. Very good, ma'am. If you two would follow me to the transporter, we will be on our way, he said, turning and walking to a small pod. We both followed as I asked. So are you coming with us, or are you just getting us there? I will be accompanying you to the location, but no further. Once you're in Dragon Bridge, I will be heading back, he said, closing the door behind us. Damn, it would have been nice to have a courser on a mission like this, I said. Coursers are only meant to hunt down escaped since. Now, be prepared, and this will sting, he said in his monotone voice. That was all I heard before there was a flash of light, a feel of a bee stinging me, a lot, then another flash, and we were no longer in the Ministry. It was dark out, and all I could see was Las Alicorn in the distance, and just across from where we were standing, there was a settlement with makeshift walls of scrap metal around it. Within the open gate, just past the first few shacks, I could see a large bridge going over a gap in the earth that separated one half of the town from the other. The bridge was green and black, and had to have been built before the war, from the looks of it. Over the gate that led to the town, I saw a sign over it that said, Dragon Bridge. Vervain and I looked in awe at this settlement, as we saw Dashites, earth ponies, and even unicorns walking through the streets like they didn't have a single care in the world. Then, before I could even ask a single question, X-532 said, This is where I leave you. The director says good luck. And another flash of light, he was gone. Well, that was rude, I said, looking at the spot where the courser had vanished. Vervain shrugged. He's a robot. Who cares? Now let's get into town and see if we can find the place where this Black Delilah is. We don't have a lot of time to sightsee even though this settlement looks interesting. I don't think I've ever seen this many pegasi in one place before that weren't trying to kill me, I said as we both started walking closer to town. This settlement wasn't here when I was a steel ranger in Los Alicorn, but I've seen the bridge before. It used to be a way for ponies to move goods easily over the river that used to be here, built a few years before the war even started. It was named Dragon Bridge because a dragon named Spike did something to help with its creation. I don't know what it was, though. I never thought a town would show up here either, Ravane said. Do you think the Pegasi here are all Dashites? I asked as I drew closer to the gate. Have to be, or runaway enclave. I am not surprised to see a lot of them in one place, however. Stratus, out of all the Cloud Cities, is the highest number of Dashites per year. Las Alicorn isn't too far from it, and the perfect location for a Dashite to flee, she said. I'd figured they'd go more inland than west. Los Alicorn is a dead city. Why come this far west instead of settling near New Pegasus? I asked. Some do, but not every pony likes to be around the city. Too many drunks and problems with the factions there. Going inland just means they run the risk of running into more enclave. Dashites fear running into their old faction because a lot of the time they are treated like dirt, or worse. Other times they're just outright killed. Coming west is the best thing for them, because Stratus has the furthest west enclave-controlled city in the wasteland. They don't dare go too close to Las Alicorn, because steel rangers here are experts at killing them, Ravane said. So they come out here and stay away from the city itself, but use their closeness to it to keep the enclave from bothering them? That's what I'd guess. Though, being this close to my brother's branch is also dangerous. I wonder if the city has some deal with them so they don't have to worry, she said as we finally made it to the gate where two guards were standing. Guess I'll have to ask some pony inside, I said as the Pegasus mare in armor had the dashite mark on it. I'm guessing she was proud of her banishment. She came over to me. Welcome to Dragon Bridge. Before you enter, we need to know, do you work with the Steel Rangers or are you here on behalf of the Enclave or the Rumored Ministry? She asked. Neither. My mother and I are here to see about trading and getting some intel about some pony, I said. Ravane came up next to me, nodding her head. Yes, 
An old Dashite friend of mine sent me a letter not long ago, saying that he'd taken ill. I've come to check up on him and to say goodbye if he's taken his turn. She looked suspiciously at the two of us. You expect me to believe the two of you are related? Irvain, who was an expert liar after her years of doing so in 28, chuckled, saying, You mean because I'm an earth pony and my daughter's a unicorn? Yes, we get that a lot. She put on an ashamed face. She's a blessing to me by the goddesses, I'd like to say. I used to work with one of the smaller casinos in New Pegasus, you see. One of my clients I had was a unicorn and took a liking to me. That was until I got knocked up. Lost my job after I said I was going to keep the foal and took up life as a traitor. She rolled her eyes. I don't need your whole sob story. Okay, so you're just an old whore. I get it. Fine. Well, who's the Pegasus you're looking for? I can at least point you to where he lives. I know every pony in this town. For a moment, I thought we were done for. But to my amazement, Vervain answered without a missing a beat. Rufflewing, I do hope the old bat's feeling better. Her face changed in an instant from suspicious to happy. You know that old buck? I didn't think he had many friends left in the world. I didn't know he took ill, though. Just saw him two nights ago yelling at some of the younger ones who were fighting near his bar. Maybe he was exaggerating again. He's done it before just to drag me away from my work. And yes, I do know him. He's an old friend of my dad's, Vervain responded. She laughed. That sounds like him. Well, I'm not sure if you've been here before, but you can find his bar just over the bridge. It's the second building on your right. Just across from the Miss Maple Trees Cafe. When you see him, tell him Soulwind says hey. I will, and thank you for your help, Vervain said as we walked past her and into the Dragon Bridge. As we were past the guards and working our way towards the large bridge, I asked, how in the goddess's name did you know there was a Dashite you asked about here? She chuckled. I may not have seen this town itself, but Ruffle Ring was an old friend of my father's, as I said. Honestly, I'm surprised he's still alive. He's older than my dad. But I did know that he settled here a few years back when the town was first constructed. Box tape new Pegasi? I asked. Oh, wait, I think I remember him telling me that he knew a few of them over the years. She laughed again. My father wasn't like most steel rangers, as you know. He got along fine with most pegasi, earth ponies, unicorns, even zebra. Hell, he was closest to the griffins more than even his own race. That's how he was able to set up the Equestrian Express. He had contacts all over the wasteland in his heyday. So you know this Rufflewing too? I asked. Not that well. I haven't seen him in over twelve years, but I did keep in contact with him until I went into Stable 28. Well, we'll head to his place first and say hi before we head over to the cafe. We just have a couple of hours before we need to meet our contact. She said as we stepped onto the old bridge and headed over the gap that ran through the settlement. I've always wondered why he didn't have any other couriers apart from me when I first met him. From what I've learned, he didn't seem to lose any of his contacts over the years. Most ponies still knew and kept in contact with him, I said. I wanted the same thing when I got out of Stable 28, so I asked him about it. When I went into the stable, Equestrian Express was running as smoothly as it ever had, she said, stopping just before the bridge ended and looking out over the gap. My father told me that a year or so before uh, he started having issues with couriers going missing. Every pony he sent out really came back. One after another, they just kept disappearing until he only had one left. He said something of when he first met him that the last courier hasn't come back from his last job. I always just assumed that something happened to his only employee, or he was just as bad as his job as I am mine. I said. No, out of all of his couriers, this last one before you never had issues. He always returned, even when my father would send him out to find packages his missing couriers lost. Even after he met you, I still figured his stallion would show up again, as he always did. But he never did. My dad wasn't sure if his luck had run out, or if something else was going on. He meant to have you go looking for him one day, 
but life has a funny way of laughing in your face when you think you control how the world works, especially the wasteland. No pony knows what happened to him? I asked. After I talked to my dad about the last courier, I started looking into it myself, Mervain said with a sigh. I heard a few rumors about an Equestrian Express courier who took over a place called Division. The rumors made it sound like it was the courier, meaning you, but I knew it wasn't since you were in the kingdom at the time. You think this courier is still alive? I asked. I think he is. Whatever he's up to, he's doing something in Division. Something he's putting my father's company name to. Even after a Question Express was destroyed, I still was able to get more and more rumors like stories from Division about a tribal stallion with the Equestrian Express duster starting an army or something like that, she said. Honestly, I think the fall of my father's business over the last years was because of him, but I can't prove anything. I sighed. Sounds like more trouble I might have to deal with one day. What was this pony's name? Dad never knew his real name. He only went by the name of his old tribe, Tangled Mane. Though I don't think you should worry about him. From what I've learned, Division is halfway between New Pegasus and the Kingdom. Too far for us to worry about, she said with a smile. I thought about what she said for a moment, then my eyes went wide. Is it an abandoned city that's mostly destroyed? She shrugged. Sounds about right. It's not like I've seen the place myself, but the pony who's told me about it said something around the same lines of what you said. I think we stopped there, on top of an old skyscraper on our way to the kingdom, I said, remembering the place well now. Well, like I said, it doesn't matter. No matter what he does or doesn't do, he can't ruin my father's company any more than it already has been. Even if you were able to get it going again, you're too famous for any pony to believe that anything they hear about the division or tangled mare. He, she said with another smile. Now, how about we go see my dad's old friend, then get to our meeting with this black Delilah finished? Sounds like a good idea, I said as I followed Ravane off the bridge and towards the small bar just beyond. As we walked, in the back of my mind, something about her story, about this tangled mane, tugged at my thoughts, as if no matter what I wanted, one day I would meet the stallion, for good or ill. With my mind filled with what this other courier and the plans they were putting together, I didn't notice the small ping on my pit butt gave off, indicating that some pony had sent me a broadcast message. Footnote. Level up. New perk added. Flatline. Your heart has been replaced with some robo-plastic dickery-doo. So, by the Ministry, as you already know. What you don't know is now that it has synchronized completely with your body, it's become fully functional. Now that all systems are a go, you cannot be poisoned and special filters regulate bleeding more efficiently and allow all healing items and chems to function at a higher rate. Therefore, lasting longer and healing more effectively. As an added bonus, robots and synths are confused by your upgrades and are 50% less likely to you score a critical hit. You should probably also know that you don't technically have a heartbeat. Just a heads up.